All right, hey everyone, uh, Lance Hedrick here. Um, we're doing part two today on espresso. So just so y'all know, to rope you in, because I know important in early rope in is, today we're gonna learn to taste espresso. We're gonna learn how to dial in your espresso based on taste. Now, what does that mean? It means it doesn't matter what espresso machine you have. Anything you've got, it's gonna work because it's all about extraction. We're gonna taste based off of extractions, okay? So I'm not gonna give you exact recipes because that's not helpful because everyone tastes differently, all right? So that's my rope in, all right? So now you're gonna stay for the whole show, right? As y'all know, I'm very technical, right? In all my videos, I'm very logical, I'm to the point, I'm very analytical, and what I have noticed is only 7% uh, of everyone who has watched my videos have are subscribed. That's crazy, 93% of you aren't subscribed. And uh, as y'all know, and I know this sounds beggy, but uh, as y'all know, Subscribers are huge. Uh, it's gonna help me be able to get that monetization. And honestly, I'm gonna be completely transparent with you. What I'm doing with my monetization is paying for my camera crew. They have been incredible and allowed me to wait until it's monetized in order to start paying. So I need that in order to help these productions. Other than that, it's gonna be out of my pocket, uh, which you know is whatever. But I would really enjoy it if you would take a few seconds, which I'm gonna give you right now to hit that button on subscribe and Nice, now we have 100% subscribers. Thank you so much for that, I appreciate it. Now we're gonna get into how to taste espresso, how to dial in by taste, and how I distribute coffee. Yes, we're also gonna talk about uh, coffee distribution when it comes to espresso. Now, coffee extracts in three phases, all right? So we're gonna put the graphics like I do with my hands, right? When espresso starts to extract, as that water begins to hit that puck and the pressure kicks on, the first thing that comes out are those acids and those different components that on our tongue can be tasted as sour or salty. So if we had kind of like a, a gas gauge here, like a toggle, right? The first bit right here is gonna be sour and salty. So if this is the full of our extraction, if we extracted all the bits that we can from coffee, that would end here, right? So this is extracting no coffee, this is extracting all the coffee that we can. So the first bit are sour and salty. That's what we perceive them on our tongue. Sour and salty, sour and salty, that's the first bit. As you keep extracting, you're going to get some of those more developed sugars and it's gonna be a little sweeter. That's where the sweetness kind of comes in. And as you keep pushing the extraction on that toggle, you're going to get some of those bitter, bitter, bitter notes coming out, right? Some of those acids that are coming out are gonna be really bitter. They're gonna physically dry out your tongue. So I'm gonna say this and y'all know me, I like to be repetitive and I had one comment saying that uh, the repetition was annoying. Well, guess what? Not gonna change, all right? We're gonna be repetitive because it helps people learn. Sour, sweet, bitter, sour, sweet, bitter. You may, say, wow, I've got a shot that tastes really bitter, uh, so it must be over-extracted, because it's just so bitter. Well, here's the thing. If you recall from that first video, fine migration happens at the beginning of extraction. The more brittle your coffee, so maybe the darker your coffee, the more apt it will be to have more fines in that cup. Fines are very bitter. It's literally bits of coffee on your tongue. So you could have an under-extracted shot that was very bitter. Also from that first video, I'm not gonna go in depth here, but you can have a very under-extracted shot that tastes over-extracted because of channeling. So we have to be very careful when we're dialing in coffees to take into account that bitter could also be under-extracted. So I like to say with bitter, it's watery, drying, and bitter, okay? Because watery, remember from my first video, where there's that inverse relationship, which I won't get into here. We'll just link that video here. If you stumbled onto this one and haven't seen part one, go to it right now, all right? Good. So, um, yeah, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna talk about um, um, the, these phases of extraction and how they're affecting, uh, how they're, how they're uh, affecting the flavor profile as it's going on. Now, let me tell you this. I know you're, you're hearing this going dialing in by taste. Well, I don't have that great of a palate. I see these, these, these coffee professionals take their spoon, they're going <laughs> And you know what, I can't, I can't do that, I can't taste it. I can't sit here and go, mm, that's brulee grapefruit, mm, that's lemongrass, oh, I get jasmine and chamomile. Okay, I'm not asking you to do that. That's not a problem, there's no need to do that. We're trying to get you to taste your espresso the way that you want it to taste. And for that, I'm just asking that you're able to taste sour. So if you taste it and you go, like the warheads, you know, you're like, oh, that's sour. Or if it's salty, salts also are coming out early on, so if it's extremely salty or sour, you're gonna be like, woo, right? You know, it's salty. If it's physically drying your tongue out, like if you have a really tannic wine, 
that's probably over extracted. And if it's really balanced, if it's really sweet, if it's really good, ah, well, don't change anything, right? Um, but there's, a, you can always ask yourself, what could I have more of? Could I have more acidity? Could I have more pop, more crisp? Maybe you wanna pull back the extraction a bit. Uh, or maybe you're saying, could it be sweeter? Could it be like juicier and fuller? So anyway, if you're wanting to kind of push that extraction, get it maybe sweeter, maybe a more balanced body because you're going through all those phases and pulling out as much as possible, you may wanna push the extraction. So. That's what we're gonna look out today. And, uh, I, but before getting into that, before we pull what's called a salami shot and we taste together, cause I'm hoping you're buying an espresso machine or if you're binging these at night, do it in the morning. You don't have to do it alongside me. But if you're buying an espresso machine, that's fantastic. Before we do that though, I'm gonna take a tangent as I always do. And we're gonna talk about puck preparation. I was going to talk about it in my last video, you know me, my rants went way too long. I included way too much information. We ran out of time. So we're gonna do that today. We're gonna to talk about espresso distribution, puck preparation. The most important thing for espresso outside the grinder is your puck preparation. Now, what is puck preparation? It's literally what it sounds like. As I always say, coffee is intuitive. Don't overcomplicate it. It is putting that coffee into your basket and ensuring that it's as even as possible so that when the water hits, it's going through as even as possible. So that includes dosing into the basket, that includes distributing the coffee, and that includes tamping, all right? So let's take a look at that. I am going to dose my coffee, all right? All right, so first thing, I, I actually typically tend to uh, grind into a canister like this and then dump it in my portafilter. It's completely fine to go straight into your portafilter. What I find doing this though, is if there are clumps, you can take a fork or something and you can, you can knock some of those clumps out before putting it in. Um, also just transferring it helps it be a little less clumpy. Um, anyway, so I'm gonna pull it, put it in here. Again, there's no need to do it. You can go straight into your portafilter, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to actually not shake. I typically shake as I do it to level it out. But if you grind straight into your port filter, like at cafes, if you're a barista, or if you're someone that trains baristas or whatever, you, you, it typically looks like this, right? There's a mound in the middle. I count, I'll call this uh, Mount Crumpet, right? We all know, uh, some of us know the Grinch, right? How the Grinch stole Christmas, right? So we have Mount Crumpet, all right? And around here is Whoville. Now, the Grinch doesn't like the Who's in Whoville, right? So, but, but what we want is we want Christmas cheer for all around, and we want the holiday cheer. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to introduce the Grinch to all the Who's in Whoville, all right? And the way I'm gonna do that is I, so there are many ways of doing this actually, and we're gonna go over them all. There's one called the stock fleth method. I don't like the stock fleth method. Uh, first off, you're gonna get grounds all in your hands. Um, you know, you have to, and then it's like ingrained in the little lines in your hands. It's like, uh, I don't really want that. Then at night you're smelling it, which for a long time I really enjoyed for the first five years of being a barista. And then it was just like, all right, I kinda, I kinda want clean hands. Uh, but stock fleth is taking your hand like this, right? And you're rotating around, boom. Boom, right? And what, what's going on, I'll just do it. What's, what's happening is you are just spreading those grounds out around the basket as evenly as possible. And see, it's flattening out the bed. You see that? And you see how my elbows are out and I'm just rotating. I'm just rotating. And then look, we're, we're at a level bed, right? So that's stock cleft. There's another method called north, south, east, west, which is exactly what it sounds like. You push north, you push south, you push east, you push west. North, south, east, west. And you just keep doing that until it's level. But let's think about these, and there's other finger distribution methods, but let's think about this. When we're pushing, what part of the bed is that affecting? It's just affecting that mount uh, crumpet. We're not affecting the who's at all. Well, the who's aren't perfect. We gotta give this a love too, right? It may be a little less dense over here or a little less dense over here, but all we're able to distribute with our finger is that top layer. So there could be a, 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 you know, less dense areas throughout here. So maybe the top looks perfectly flat. Like we sit here and we sit, we sit and we're, we're distributing, we're distributing until it's perfectly level. Oh, like it's, it's like, oh wow, I'm the best at this. I'm the best, look how level that is. But then once we tamp it, guess what? There could be less concentrated areas. Water will expose that. So what, what is a barista to do? What is a home enthusiast to do? Well, I'm gonna just go ahead and tell you, throw out those finger methods. I said it, I know, I get it, ah, whatever. All right, we're gonna throw out those finger methods. I'm gonna dump these grounds, I know that's a little, that's a little wasteful, but you know, we're, uh, we're doing this on, I'm using old coffee, it's fine. All right, so I'm gonna do this again, and I'm gonna show you kind of uh, what, what is an ideal way of distributing the coffee for the most even and consistent extractions possible. And I will invite you to do side-by-sides with all variables the same to see how much slower this is going to pull because it is more evenly extracted, okay? Do you see what I'm saying there? The, the way that I'm about to show you if you do this next to a stock fleth only method, uh, this will pull slower because the water is going through all those grounds evenly. The other one will pull faster because there will be channels in it, right? So we're negating channels by doing what I'm about to show you which is called horizontal distribution. All right, so I've got my grounds again and I am putting them in and I'm just gonna put them in so that we get uh, uh, Mount Crumpet again and what we're gonna do is we're gonna introduce 
the Grinch to the Who's, all right? So you've got Crumpet there, but what I'm gonna do this time is I'm taking my hand and I'm gonna gently tap the sides. Now look what's happening, you see that? As I tap the side and I kind of tilt where there's less coffee, look at that, it vibrates into place. We see that? Look, it vibrates into place. So not only do we have a flat top without using our finger, but we have been able to effectively vibrate these grounds and shake them into place. So if there was less concentrated areas, we shook it into place by tapping, ta 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 boom, right? And now after that, if you have enough coffee in the puck and you want to finish with the stock fleth, that's completely fine. Because it is, the stock fleth and the north south, those are properly uh, grooming that top layer. It's just how do we get that bottom layer groomed? You know, you could grind some of it and what I what I actually do is I grind into this can canister, right? I'll dump some in and I shake it. Dump some in, shake it, dump some in, shake it, and then I finish with tapping, right? Uh, or you could put it all in and you could just tap, tap, tap. Now if you're at a shop and you use say an OCD like we do at Onyx Coffee Lab, for, for if y'all didn't know I work at Onyx Coffee Lab, um, we use OCDs. Uh, we tend to tap and then we'll put the OCD in and this Grooms that top layer. And look, it almost looks like it's tamped, right? Um, so now we have this perfect bed on which we can tamp, all right? So we have distributed that coffee and now we can tamp on top. I do wanna take a brief tangent because I'm full of tangents all the time. There is a more and more used method and I'm actually getting one of these tomorrow. I didn't get it in time for this video, but I wouldn't have really harped on it anyway because this is, I don't wanna make y'all go and buy new stuff. But I'll be doing stuff on my Instagram with it once I have it in tomorrow or Saturday, I guess. Today's Thursday, I'm shooting for Friday. Anyway, uh, it's called the Weiss distribution technique. All right, now what this is, is if you've ever seen those head massagers that have those like claws on it, right? Those little wires that you're like, oh, that feels so great. Well, it's essentially that, but miniature. And what you do with it is you kind of scoop around in your espresso and it fluffs up the bed and it negates these clumps and it helps fill any type of holes. That is an incredible way to increase your extraction. Whether you have a 54 millimeter machine, 53 millimeter machine, 57, 58, whatever you have at home, it will help you increase your extraction. Uh, and you can take a, a way to do it that's kind of janky and it works okay. It's taking like a wine cork and straightening out paper clips and putting four in a wine cork and using that to scrape. I would recommend getting some of these that have really nice needles that are like 0 0.2, 0 0.25 millimeters. Um, that's gonna really help you not move the grounds too much and it helps you just instead kind of break up clumps. And anyway, that's called the Weiss distribution technique. Feel free to look that up. We're not including that today because most people don't have those um, and this works really well. So I did my horizontal tapping and I distributed whether with my finger or whether with like an OCD or some sort of distribution tool. All right, so now I have a very flat bed. The next thing that's highly important is the tamp, right? Now I'm going to blow some minds here, all right? Tamp pressure is important to an extent. What is important about tamping is getting the grounds as close as possible. Once you have them as close as possible, that tamp is gonna stop moving. Once that tamp stops moving, there is no such thing as tamping harder. I've heard people say, you know, my, my, my espresso is running too fast, I should probably tamp harder. No, 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 no. If you have tamped to where it's no longer moving, that is as hard as it's gonna go. I promise you, you can, you can come at me in the comments, there is science to back this up. There is no chance, once all of that space has been negated between those grounds, there's no more pushing through. And in fact, I think three years ago, Matt Perger at Barista Hustle did, did a big study on it, but there is no going further than that. And, and, and I always say when I'm training people, uh, you, you see people in, in cafes, right? You see them behind bar and you'll see them put the tamper in, they get ready and they get up on their toes and they're pushing down like that, right? And they're, they have like this look in their eyes, there's blood veins popping out of their necks. And I'm like, oh my goodness, chill out. Well, people think that's necessary, that you have to tamp super hard, but I'm just telling you, you push until it no longer pushes. And once, once you have that, it's done, you're done. Put it in the machine and go. Typically, that's around 25 pounds of pressure. So if you do have a bathroom scale and you're curious what that's like, you can do that. But I'm just telling you, there's no reason to try to replicate doing less than 25 because you may have found something because you're not gonna be able to. So hit that full amount of pressure and you're good to go, all right? So just push down and you're good to go. How do we tamp? Well, I, I teach like this. You make your fingers into a T. You have your index finger that aligns the head of the tamper, and then you make your thumb on a T, like so, all right? And then we're distributing evenly the pressure we're pushing through our thumb and our finger. Now, a lot of baristas teach to do it like this, right? Where your elbow is out like so. And this is completely fine. And, and for home baristas who aren't tamping a thousand a day every day, completely fine. You're not gonna hurt yourself in the long run, right? You're getting yourself in a nice 90 degree angle and you're pushing down. And so from a side angle, I guess we actually have a side angle right here. Uh, and we're pushing down, right? As evenly as possible between our finger and our thumb. We don't want it to look like this. 
Actually, this tamp fits so perfectly, it's difficult to, to tilt it at all. But we don't want it to be thumb heavy, where it's like so. We don't want it to be finger heavy, like so. We want it evenly distributed. So what I like to do is I first push my tamper in like so. I feel with my fingers. I feel with my fingers, make sure it's level on both sides between the head and the tamper, and then I push. Now, if you're a barista, I actually have talked to a physical therapist about this. Uh, doing that is terrible on your joints. Awful. You don't do push-ups like this, right? Why don't you do push-ups like this? That'll rip your shoulder joints to shreds. To shreds. How do you do push-ups? You put your elbows closer to your side. You can do 45 degree. You can do right next to your side, right? That's how you do push-ups. Same thing with tamping if you're wanting to save your shoulder. If you're a barista, I would recommend going perpendicular to the table. And this may be more work, but it's going to save you. Barista joints are not, no joke. Getting your elbow close to your side and pushing using the compound motion of your deltoid, your latissimus, your tricep, all of it all in conjunction with one another, keeping it together so you're not hurting your joint. I actually have an AC separation, so I have like a bone that juts up here, and it saved my life when I learned this from the physical therapist. Um, that was actually at a barista academy in New York when I just happened to be there. They came up to me and embarrassed me. This is just a fun side story. They came up, I was practicing for something, and they said, with a class, they said, hey, can you show us how you tamp? And of course, being the good barista, I go up, I do my 90 degrees and I push. And they look to the class and said, see, this is what I was talking about. That is gonna kill this young man's shoulder. And I was like, what is going on? So then I listened on the class, changed my life. I don't have, uh, my shoulder never hurts when I tamp, which is incredible. But for, like I said, home enthusiasts, it's fine to do the 90 degrees because you're not tamping that often. Baristas, I would highly recommend thinking about doing that so you're not hurting your wrist, your elbow, your, you wanna do that compound motion where it's together. It's like doing push-ups, right? Anyway, so we want an extraordinarily even tamp. Right? It has to be even because we want that water to go through evenly. If it's unlevel at all, that water is going to cascade down that little hill and it's going to over extract one side of the bed. The idea of having that perfect pup preparation is to finish it with an even tamp. All right? So now we have that perfect pup preparation where we did that tapping to vibrate everything so that we distributed the bottom half of the puck. And we either use our finger, we use a distribution tool, or honestly, if you tap well enough, you can get a really nice flat level top for the tamp. So now we've distributed. We have maybe used the Weiss distribution technique and you have uh, hit some of those clumps out, but don't worry about the clumps. They will go away with the pressure. It does slightly increase extraction though. And then we tamped it and now we're good to go. So that, that excursus is over. That is how I distribute uh, espresso. Please, um, I would love to have uh, lo loving debates in the comments about this, um, about this being uh, the best way to distribute uh, because I have done many side-by-sides, have done blind tastes for people and um, a lot of other people have done it as well. Now, uh, before saying anything, I would urge you to try it yourself. Pull two shots, do one where you do just that top grooming, and then do one where you do that tapping. And I promise you, that latter one, the tapping, is going to be a longer extraction because it's extracting more. So you're going to be able to get more out of your coffee, you're going to get more sweetness, you're going to get more balance, you're going to just be able to extract more. Um, so, that is that. Now, what we are going to get back to is, uh, is talking about dialing in by taste. So. All I'm asking you to be able to do with that toggle, which is what again? Sour, sweet, bitter. I probably should have said sour, sweet, bitter since I'm talking about a toggle, but we're gonna think about that. As you keep going, also from the last video, the viscosity changes, right? So with that bitter, remember that it can be drying and it can be watery, all right? So as we're pulling espresso, the first big tip I can give you is always start coarser than you need. That's right, coarser than you need. Start at the coarser, uh, coarser end of things. If you start too fine, you can get this weird thing, and I touched on it last video, you can get this weird phenomenon happening where you may think, oh wow, it's, uh, it's over extracted, I need to dial back. Or you might think, wow, it's under extracted. Well, when you go really fine, that water, it's harder and harder for it to move through. And it's like, I cannot get anywhere. And it'll start channeling or it'll do just weird things. And it, it's gonna not give you a proper representation of what's going on. So I like to tell people to start coarser. And this is true with pour overs as well. Once you get really fine, things go wonky. It's kind of like quantum physics. You, you think something's here when really it's here and really it's both places at the same time. Schrodinger's cat, who knows what's going on. So start with it coarser and slowly go finer and finer depending on your extraction needs. I also always recommend to start at a one to two and a half ratio and go up and down based on your desire of consistency. Obviously, if you want a thicker shot, go on a shorter ratio. Smaller the ratio, the more concentrated the espresso. If you want a more watery, like a longue shot, you know, go up to one to three. If your coffee has a lot to extract and it's really sour, even at a one to two and a half, 
bump it up, right? So there are a lot of things that we can do like that, but what we're gonna talk about is doing it by taste. So the first thing we're gonna do though is what I call the salami shot. If you're beside your machine, do this. Just get a coffee, put it at a pretty fine grind where you know it's gonna run in 20, 25, 30 seconds. It doesn't really matter how dialed in it is. We just want a proper-ish shot. I don't want a 10 second shot. I don't want a minute long shot. Get it in the 20, 30, 35 second range. Good to go, all right? We're gonna pull our shot. So we're gonna do a salami shot. I actually forgot to bring three glasses today, so I found this dope little shot glass we're gonna use as my third cup. So what you need for this are three cups, three espresso cups, whatever cups you've got, that works. Um, and we're going to see what that tastes like when I say sour, sweet, bitter. We're gonna see what that tastes like, all right? So I'm gonna weigh out my shot. And again, you don't have to, you do not have to have this perfectly dialed in for this. It doesn't matter because all coffee extracts sour, sweet, bitter, whether it's pour overs, whether it's espresso, sour, sweet, bitter, sour, sweet, bitter. All right. All right. Horizontal tapping, pop, 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 pop. Look at that, it's leveling out so nicely, leveling out. I'm just, because I have my OCD here, because I'm OCD here, I'm gonna pop that in. I'm gonna twist it a few times. I'm gonna take my tamp, put it in. I like to feel to the sides, make sure it's level before I even tamp. And I take it, you can either do the 90 degree or you can get it close to your side. Push until it stops pushing, done. Now I'm gonna take this, load it into my machine. I'm gonna wipe, so there's a little bit of dirty there. I'm gonna take my three cups, and I'm gonna get them lined up right here. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna get down on my knees so we can talk closer. I'm gonna start my shot, and I'm gonna get one cup underneath. Now, pre-infusion's going. All pre-infusion is, is water coming out of low pressure, which is helping expand that puck and it actually helps negate channels. Now those first drops are coming out and they're really thick, all right? I'm gonna switch cups after about uh, 12 seconds or so. And then I'm gonna switch cups once more at about the 18 to 20 second mark. And now it's really watery as we see. We see under here, it's really watery now, and I'm gonna stop at about uh, 25 seconds, right? So we probably pulled about a two, two and a half ounce shot there. But as you see that last little bit, see how watery that is, how it's like kind of caramel color? All right, so we have our three shots here. One, two, and three. Now what I want you to do with these is first I want you to feel your cups. Feel the temperatures. The temperature, what do you think it's gonna do first of all? Dora the Explorer time, swipe or no swipey. What do you think is gonna happen temperature-wise? Do you think the temperature is gonna go down because it's a longer shot, or is it gonna go up? That's right, it's gonna go up because that inverse relationship of coffee to water. As there's more hot water going through, that coffee is no longer absorbing the heat and trying to give off anything. So it's mostly just really daggum hot water coming through at the end. So this final shot is steaming, and I can barely hold it. You see the steam coming off? It's insane, it's really, really hot. This first one is not very hot at all because that puck absorbs so much of that heat. All right, so what I want you to do, yep, it's time. We're gonna taste these. So take that first shot. That was like the first few seconds, the first few grams of droppage. Smell it. You see it's very acidic. It's got a really pungent, uh, really pungent kind of like, it could be fruity, depending on your coffee. It could be fruity, it could be sour, it could be whatever it might be. But go ahead and take a little sip. Woo, Woo. Uh, every time I do that, that is a genuine reaction, by the way. Um, Oh my goodness, it's salty and extraordinarily sour. Um, there are some bitters in it, but not as much because this coffee isn't that dark. And just another excursion to the side, the darker your coffee, the more fines are gonna be produced regardless of the, the niceness of your, uh, of your grinder because it's so brittle. Uh, darker coffee, heat's being applied to it longer. It's gonna be more brittle, right? Just makes sense. All right, let's, let's, let's chase that with, uh, with this, the middle salami shot. I don't know why it's called salami shots. I actually just learned that term like three weeks ago, though I've been teaching this for years. Um, Anyway, second shot. This one will be the best of the three shots, all right? So we're gonna give it a sniff. And remember, they're gonna get hotter. This one's more caramelly. There's a lot more sugar browning notes in this. Wow, yeah, it's like toffee, caramel. That's nice smelling. All right, and it's also less viscous, right? A little bit more watery. It's kind of pleasant. It's still a little sour, uh, but it's kind of pleasant. It's quite sweet. It's pretty solid. This one obviously is more chuggable, right? You gotta throw that back. All right, this one's gonna be very hot. I don't want you to burn your tongue, so don't, don't throw it back. If you have a spoon or something, maybe swirl it. Just be cautious coming to this one, because like I said, normally a shot isn't that hot, but it's because it has those cooler first extractants, and then it's got this hotter stuff, and it kind of takes away some of that temp. This one's all like extraordinarily watery, really low extraction, mostly washing those grounds, um, and it's not gonna taste like much. You're gonna think, 
because people always say bitter shots are over extracted. You're going to think this is going to be super bitter. In reality, there's not much there. What is there is pretty bitter, but it's not going to be crazy like that first sip. This one will probably be the least uh, overwhelming of the three. There's not going to be much flavor in it. It will dry your tongue out though, uh, and it's going to be very hot. So let's, let's maybe swirl it a bit and take a little sip. Smell it. All right. Not much smell. There's not much aroma at all. We're going to taste it. It's like water. It's honestly, it's like, it's like you soaked full coffee beans in water and heated it up, right? There's not much flavor going on there. I'm just drying a little bit. I probably should have run it a little longer. I cut it pretty short. Um, but yeah, now what we're going to do, this is the fun part. So we're going to take all three of these, dump them together. Boom. And then take, take a sip. Balanced shot of espresso. So that is a salami shot. Now you understand what I say when I mean salty, sour, when I say bitter, watery, okay? So very simple. Um, this is a very simple lesson. How to dial in, people always ask. Well, we're gonna take those extraction variables that we've learned and how they affect extraction, okay? And we're gonna taste our espresso. And if it tastes on the salty, sour side, guess what we're gonna do? We're gonna take, whoa, I almost slipped this. I'm like surfing on this rug. We're gonna take that, or I guess it's a carpet, or it's a rug, it's a rug, it's a rug. We're gonna take that espresso and we're gonna push the extraction, all right? So how do we do that? If we recall the last video, which again, I'm linking here for those people who didn't click link the first time and thought they didn't need it and now realize, oh my goodness, I needed it and I need to subscribe. <sighs> All right, for those people that do know what I'm talking about, we're gonna push that, that extraction. How do we do that? Well, we can increase the surface area of the espresso by finding the grind or, or we can increase the contact time, right? Or you could adjust the temperature of the water if that's your last recourse. But remember, that's not one of the three I recommend doing. Or we can change our ratio a bit, right? We can make it, a, if it's at one to two, we could, one to 2.25. How do we do that? If we're doing a 20 gram dose, we'll just let more water come out for the most part, more yield come out, right? So there are all these little tweaks that you can do based off of the taste, okay? And always start coarser than you need. Again, because once you get to those fine grinds, it's like Schrodinger's cat. It's like quantum physics. It's like mind boggling. It's like mind freaking you, right? Chris Angel's coming in and going, mind freak, okay? So we don't want to mess with that too fine stuff. We can get there, but let's get there in, step, in steps. You don't need to waste a ton of coffee. Don't go all the way to filter grind and slowly go back, but go to where it's a somewhat coarse espresso grind. See what it's like and slowly go back. It should not take you a bag to dial in. Should not. You should be able to find where you're wanting based off of these things. And it's going to take some time, maybe a month, maybe two months till you really get a feel of it. So maybe you are taking, you know, 100 grams, 150 grams to dial in for about a month, month and a half. But once you get the feel of things, it's going to take you two to three shots. And I'm not kidding. You're going to start to understand. And here's another little excursus to the side. You're going to start understanding roast profile, variety, um, um, age, uh, these different things are, and elevation grown are all going to affect extraction. And just to give you a little bit on each of those, roast development, again, the darker something is roasted, the more bitter, the more soluble. The lighter something is roasted in comparison to those darker ones, the less soluble, the less uh, brittle. Um, so obviously there are lighter coffees that are more soluble than other lighter coffees. I'm saying in comparison to the same coffee being roasted darker. The darker something is roasted, the more soluble. So keep that in mind so you're not over extracting, right? And remember with over extraction, for the most part, it's over extracting pockets. Right? If everything's extracted evenly, you're probably not going to hit over extraction. Anyway, again, in a digression. Um, when we're talking about elevation, the higher something is grown, if you see on your bag 2,000 meters above sea level, MASL, that's really high elevation. It's going to be really dense, right? And it's harder to extract those. So you're going to have to try harder to extract the lower the elevation, the less dense, easier to extract, right? And obviously, I'm painting with a broad stroke here, okay? Um, then we have like a, a um, varietal or variety. There are varieties that are easier to extract than others based off of inherent uh, denseness, so our density. Pacamaras, for instance, are really big, uh, really big be uh, beans that are like margohipe, okay? Those are not very dense at all. They're very easily extractable. Um, and then you have pea berries, which are, it's not a variety. Uh, it's, it's small screen-sized coffee beans, um, and you find them a lot in uh, Kenya, or you'll see like Kenya pea berry, right? Um, but those are really small, really dense, a little bit harder to extract. Again, painting with a broad stroke, but for the most part, these rolls are going to work. So keep those in mind when you're trying to dial in. But as you're dialing in by taste, you take those sips and reminisce on, on the experience of that salami shot. If it's salty, sour. If it's a, a more acidic, um, but the big word there is sour, push the extraction further. Let that contact time longer or change the ratio or change the grind size, right? Um, and then if you're tasting it and it's drying and watery and bitter, pull back the ratio 
or change change the grind size a bit to inhibit that flow or you know do any of those types of things. So remember though, I keep talking about the weirdness that happens when you go too far in one direction. It turns into quantum physics if you go too far. If you keep going finer and finer and finer and finer, the opposite of your intention is going to happen. So keep that in mind. There's a range that we're gonna to try to stick in as far as that grind size goes because once you get out of it, you're gonna have a lot of this channeling. And then one last thing I wanna talk about there is a way you can go finer and the flow will increase and you're gonna be like, oh my goodness, I'm as fine as my grinder can go and it's still going too fast, I can't slow it down. Don't rely just on grind size because if you go too fine on the grind, that water, which is lazy, is going to find a, pl a place to go a channel and it's gonna expose it and expose it harder and harder and harder because it's going, listen, I cannot get through this puck, I can't do it. Oh, I found a spot and I'm gonna expose it. And so you can get some really bad channels uh, in that way and it can increase the flow and you might think you need to go finer and finer and you can't. Well, how about this? Go coarser. I like doing a coarser grind on a bigger, bigger basket. The issue is most of y'all don't have baskets big enough for this. I like doing 25 gram doses if I can um, with a coarser grind because the extra amount of coffee slows down the water, right? More coffee to go through, the water takes a bit longer. But the coarser you can go, the better for extraction because the finer you go, and this may, be, this may be a little shocker for you, coffee is hydrophobic. Coffee's like cocoa powder. Have you ever put cocoa in milk or in water or something and you've seen it clump up and you have to like push it against the sides and it's like, come on, mix in. Same thing with coffee. Coffee doesn't wanna, doesn't wanna mix in. It doesn't want to, it hates it. It's like, stop, this water, I don't like it. It doesn't feel good. So because it's hydrophobic, the finer you go, the more they're gonna wanna clump up and say, no water, don't come in here, I don't want you, okay? So the course you can go and still get in a, 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 a shot that you enjoy, the better, right? Uh, so uh, the thing I wanna leave you with is break all the rules. I know that people say the shot range should be 20 to 30 or 25 to 35, no, no, no. I was one of the coaches for Andrea who won the United States Barista Championship last year. I love pulling 40 second shots on my Breville. There's like a nine, 10 second pre-infusion, but I love to go 40, 45 seconds sometimes on some, uh, some coffees. If you have a really nice even extraction and, the, uh, and that flow is going pretty evenly and it's not channeling much, you can pull all that out of it and it'll taste delicious. So don't be scared to push outside of rules. Thank you so much. Hit the like and subscribe, leave a comment, do all that good stuff, boost the algorithm. Um, we'll come back soon with some more advanced latte art and other topics. And as always, drop suggestions. I am happy to do what I can uh, dropping these videos. Thank you so much. Y'all rock. Cheers.